well, nice little sneaky peek there you got of me when I uh, <laughs> when I was right at the start of the stream. Um, I didn't know it could do that. I've got two different ways of doing it. I've got the um, the YouTube side of it, and I've got a, uh, another thing that I use called OBS, which is the sort of software of how I do the streaming. Um, and you've got to start it uh, streaming on one side, and then on the YouTube side of it, it says go live. So I always assumed that... Uh, until you press go live, you're not live, but obviously you are. <laughs> so, uh, nice little uh, thing there. I just just going through my hotkeys, making sure everything works all right. Good morning. Uh, welcome to Wednesday. Um, I hope I find you well, and I hope I find you um, excited to learn about business as always. Um, apologies for the uh, for the for the not not doing the stream uh, yesterday. Um, I contacted people directly to explain the situation, but. Uh, everything's fine so don't worry about it you know um we're, we're all good here um anyway one thing i have been doing though yesterday i spent some time doing some more um i did two new um business explain using video games so i did um the one that's up about grand theft auto which i enjoyed doing uh, i think that's my new favorite thing <laughs> is making videos about video games um, but linked to business topics. But the best one I've ever done, and I really enjoyed this one uh, I did yesterday, is about Call of Duty War Warzone. And I'm going to release that um, in the next couple of days. I, that's the worry as well. Is as soon as I do these things, I want to release them. I want to get them out because I because <laughs> I enjoy them, and I don't want to get them out to you and, and let you have a look and stuff like that. But um, I know I'm sad, <laughs> as if it matters. You know, like it's just it's business content, isn't it? I shouldn't be so excited, but uh, you know. It's something to do, isn't it? And uh, you know, I think that the um, the Mister Businessman thing's doing really well. So uh, you know, I'm really pleased with it. Anyway, as well, a little little bit of a side note as well. If you go to www.mrbusinessman.co.uk, uh, just see what happens. You know, okay. So not mrbusinessman.com. I couldn't get that one, but www.mrbusinessman.co.uk and uh, and see what happens. Uh, you'll be massively disappointed. But <laughs> anyway, uh, we're going to get straight into it. We're going to do some um, market research stuff today. And now, I remember doing the market research stuff um, in class. It wasn't that long ago, but it is really, really important. Not a massive topic, but a really important one again. Obviously, I know I say that a lot, and I know I talk about the importance of all these stuff, but it, but it, you can't avoid it. How important each bit of the spec is, and when you when you really what I've realised I'm doing as well is I'm really getting them down to the bare basics. You know that's why I can do these in like an hour chunk. A lot of the time you would spend a lot longer on these things, like we would in class, having the discussions and stuff. And that is a negative thing of doing it this way. Unfortunately, using YouTube, you don't get the discussion, you don't get the time. And okay, you can use the live chat and stuff like that, and and that's fine or you can email me and things like that but it's not the same um as being one-on-one -on -one and, and having that time to, to to discuss it with each other but uh so don't don't use that use friends use family you know um chat to them about different topics about the news and that that's why i make an effort to to go through things because it's uh at the end of the day the exams are still coming aren't they whether they're this year whether they're next year whether they're coming you know whether it's university i know we've got um some second years who watch the videos and uh They've been asking me about university stuff, and I always say, "Well, look, you are going to do do more business stuff at university. Um, you know, you won't be able to avoid them. And even if we talk about it, the fact of look, um, this isn't just for exams as well. You know, like education for education's sake. Look, if you become a business person, you're going to need to know this. It's not like you can avoid it, is it? So let's get straight into it anyway. Uh, enough of me uh, yabbering on. So um, today we're going to be talking about market research. Like I said, um. And uh, it's it's a really fundamental thing, market research, and and one of the ones that uh, that trips a lot of companies up when they don't spend enough time doing it. So, lots of different things that we're going to talk about, but um, hop the nowhere near as much as this looks. So, explain what is meant by market research and the value of carrying it out. Distinguish between primary and secondary market research. Explain the different methods of primary and secondary research available to businesses. Um, evaluate the use of different methods of primary and secondary data, distinguish between qualitative and quantitative, interpret and evaluate quantitative and qualitative data, explain the issue of selecting the most appropriate method of market research, we've got to evaluate the use of market research to a business and its stakeholders, explain what is meant by sampling, explain the difference between random and quarter sampling methods, uh, understand the need to avoid bias in market research and evaluate the usefulness of sampling for a business and its stakeholders. 
So um, quite a lot of different things, but it really comes down to two sections. We've got the market research section and then the sort of sampling section. So we'll, we'll cover them. Um, you know, it won't take us any longer than usual, this one. So so we'll be good to go. Let's get straight into it. All right. So one more question. It's just, just take a moment to have a look at these. So what do you think market research is? Can you remember if it's something that you've done before, if it's brand new to you, if this is brand new information to you, what do you think market research is? Surely you've heard of it. Um. Well, market research, I'm going to give you a definition in a second, but market research is essentially looking into your market. It's looking into target markets. It's looking into uh, pricing. It's looking into different products. It's looking into opinions. Um, it, it's basically looking, it's doing the research to make sure that you understand your market that you're going to go into, essentially. Um, and uh, it, it can be very, very broad. It can be very, very... Um, sort of, of specific and it, and it depends on you can you can implement a range of different techniques as well which is the best thing to do really when when what we find when we when we start talking about this if you if you only use one form of market research it's likely to to fail um or to be less um uh, less reliable because i mean it might not fail even if you just went off your gut instinct sometimes you do uh, i wouldn't suggest it of doing no market research but uh, sometimes people do it and they're absolutely fine um what might what firms sorry what let me let me start again <laughs> have you ever been part of market research so think about it have you yourself been part of market research this is likely to be fawn this is likely to be things on the street this is likely thing to, uh, to be emails it's likely to be you know um maybe a project that you that your friend is doing or you yourself has been doing um you know something like that um what firms might try and find out uh, what might we try and find out when we're doing uh, market research? There's a couple of things, isn't there, What we that we could try and find out. We could try and find out. It's mainly your opinions about things or your behavior. Um, so that's the two different things that we're trying to find out, the behavior side of it. Um, so what kind of things do you do? How do you interact with products? What kind of products do you buy? Um, how often do you buy products? Things like that. And then we've also got the other side of it, the um, sort of... Um, we could we could ask for pricing stuff. We could ask for you know like um, you know how how comfortable do you feel with this? You know and blah 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 that kind of stuff. All right. Um, what methods might a firm try to use to find out information about the market? Well, there's a range of these. I'm not going to go through these in because I'm going to go through these in detail in a second. So let's let's park that one for a second. But why is it useful for a firm to conduct market research? That's the big one, isn't it? Well, ultimately, you've got to think about um, companies in different times. So what about for a new, uh, it's, it's AO4 again, isn't it? So what about a new company? What kind of stuff are they going to know? Well, they're going to they're gonna want to know all about the, that, that market, aren't they? They're going to want to know about all about the, um, the product itself. Like, is there a market for this product? Because we always say, don't they, there might be a gap in the market, but is there a market in the gap? It's very, very unlikely um, that you have come into contact with a brand new idea. It's not, it's not impossible, but it's just unlikely that you've come up with something completely new um that is you know um completely completely sort of unheard of in that market it, it has happened uh but but it's unlikely so you can imagine that other companies will have tried whatever you're thinking of or will have done variations on a the theme or something like that so it, it kind of gives us that reliability doesn't it? it it means that we're not just going off at a random tangent it means that we can uh, find confidence because we're going to be investing time and money in these things and other people's time and money potentially as well if we're looking for finance and things like that so we've got to be damn certain or as certain as we possibly can that we're doing the right thing at the right time in the right place and and by doing market research we can do that okay so let's get uh, into the actual thing now so it says businesses regard having an understanding of the marketplace is a major priority and i don't think a lot of amount of businesses really um understand how much of a priority this is i'd say it's one of the most fundamental things market research before you make decisions try and get the uh, data to back up what you're saying sometimes you can't sometimes the data is wrong sometimes um it can be skew if sometimes the uh, competitors you know can can make it difficult to find this information out and things like that but it's it's about the the tenacity of your company whether you will actually spend the time going and try and find this information out or are you one of these people who's willing to jump out on a limb and um, and uh and go with it you know on the off chance that you might just fail anywhere i mean it, it, you could fail even could have brilliant market research and still fail 
Um, so it's because of the following factors. So we've got the expense of launching new products. That's a big one, isn't it? We know. We talked about um, product life cycle, haven't we? Um, and uh, one of the big things in product life cycle is the amount of research and development that we do before we launch and how much money that we actually put into it before we launch the product. It's very, very expensive to launch products, but not the only the launch, which is itself is expensive because of the marketing and things like that. But the prior to launch the um money that we're spending on uh, research and development the money that we're spending on um sort of like paying people to do it the research cost and things like that is extremely expensive and remember at that point it's it's minus cash flow because you're spending money but there's no way that you could be getting any back because you're not <laughs> you don't actually have a product at that point so you can't physically be selling anything. That's why we're talking about um, product portfolios and why it's so important to have a, a range of product portfolios because we don't just want to have a product where you're only making new products one at a time. We want to have a, a range of products, so some sort of cash cow products, some uh, average products that are more successful that will uh, offset the cost of your new uh, innovation or your new investment or your new things. Um and and that's why we you know remember all these little bits of uh, business theory they all all fit together don't they um so the importance of ma maintaining market share we talked about market share the other day on stream if you didn't have a look back at the um at the at the stream that we talk about it but market share is about being dominant in your market being a price setter rather than a price taker um your ability to influence that market and make decisions that will be responded to um shall we say positively or rather not aggressively uh, by competitors um because because of your dominance in that market so we want to make sure that we can maintain it and it, remember if you're not growing your market share you're probably losing it because someone else will be growing it so it's vitally important that we do that and the importance of uh, preserving the uh, profile and brand value of existing products it's all about reducing risk. So why would we bother doing this? Well, remember, if you cock something up, if you make a massive mistake, then it completely damages the brand um, on on your uh, product, don't you? You know, it's it's really um, something which you it might be irreparable as well. It might be so want that product and then completely fumble the ball, make a, a massive uh, faux pas, and and then. You uh, you can't get that goodwill. You can't get that brand reputation back. Um, I can't think of any brands which have done this really badly in the past. Um, I mean, I suppose you could talk about the whole Coca-Cola um, new Coke thing um, and when they changed the, the, the taste of it and the backlash that they got from that. I mean, they said that they'd done market research and we'll talk about that in a second because it's a massive failure of market research at that one. Um, so let's have, let's get a definition down anyway. It says market research is the collection, collation and analysis of data relating to the marketing and consumption of goods and services. It can be either primary or secondary. So we're going to go into them in a second just to recap what they are and why they are. Uh, business activity will only be successful if the output produced can satisfy uh, people's wants and needs. Therefore, researching what things people want and need will help the business decide what to produce. It's a pretty obvious thing, isn't it? It's, it's mainly coming down to are you confident enough to go with your gut instinct or are you um, do you want to get data to back it up? Now, a couple of you watching might go, well, I'm, I'm confident enough to go with my gut instinct. I think that a lot of businesses are. And you're right, a lot of businesses don't use market research or they don't use enough market research. I don't think it would be sensible to say they don't use any because they all, even just asking someone's opinion is doing market research. Uh, but a hell of a lot of businesses and a hell of a lot of successful businesses tend to do things on, on, on gut instinct as well, which is crazy. But that's one of these things where in business theory, we can't really equate for that. We can't really say it's still not sensible business. That is still not sensible thing to for me to suggest you do is to just go into it. And, and it's okay if you're already a millionaire. It's okay if you're a really established business and you want to do crazy stuff like that and just jump into a market with no, no research. Um, because you might have the um, you might have the resources to be able to do that. But if you're a new business, uh, you're gonna have to you know when you get your business plan and you go to your bank, you go to your investor and ask for them to to invest in your business, then they're not gonna take well to oh have you done any market research? No, we've not done any market research, but I feel like this might be a good thing. Oh you excuse me, you feel like it, dear? Right? Well, no, I'm out. You see it on Dragon's Den a lot as well, don't you? So. Is that cat back? Is that jingly cat back? I, re I bet he's going to jump up on here in a second. What are you doing? Hmm? He's going to jump up in a second. 
He is, I'm telling you. Uh, anyway, so let's have a look at these. So it says here, um, objectives and market research. We'll just go through these quite quickly. And if you want to get them down, then that'd be really, really useful. Um, it says, firstly, the structure of the market. So are we in a really, really saturated market? Have we got a few competitors? Um, this is one of the, the a good starting point to, to decide the importance really of your market research. Because if you're going into a market, first of all, you won't know anything about your market. So you won't know the density of competition. But if you um, do the market research, then you can, one of the most fundamental objectives is to find that out, to find out, do we have massive competitors? Is there someone going to come after us? Is there someone going to stamp on us? Are they going to use, uh, you know, crazy pricing structures or two for ones and stuff that we just won't be able to compete with? Are they homogenous goods? Uh, are you actually selling something that everybody can buy? Are you just selling run of the mill stuff? Uh, or are you selling something with a really, really specific USP or patent or something like that? That's another thing to think about, isn't it? So we talked about uh, competition. Also, when we talk about structure of the market as well, you need to think about the types of companies. So have we got loads of private limited companies? Have we got a load of sole traders? Have we got a load of, have we got PLCs involved? You know, if that will massively affect it, won't it affect your chances of survival if you have these massive, massive companies against you versus a, a couple of sole traders? You've also got to think though, there's other things, isn't there? I talked about behavioral things and there's things behind um, market research to think of like, um, what about uh, connections that those companies already have? Um, what about the goodwill that those companies have already um, got together that you don't necessarily have? What about the connections to suppliers? Uh, is there any way? Like, the, I talked about it a while ago, didn't we? I didn't think, I don't know if I can find it. I'll see if I can find it. I'll link it in the description if I can. But it's um, a brilliant um, video was about uh, Easy Cinema. So the guy from Easy EasyJet, um, he tried to make a new new product called Easy Cinema, and the idea was that there was going to be no staff. They were going to have these sort of like ticket booths where you you skin uh, you scan a card, um, and you just go through. You know, like um, like when you get on a ride at the uh, at Alton Towers or something. You know, they have them things that you sort of walk through, and um, and the and the, the the major issue that he found wasn't the fact that uh, he wasn't able to attract customers. It was the fact that the suppliers wouldn't supply him. And why wouldn't they supply him? Well, because they had such a good um, sort of strong relationship with Cineworld, Audion, View, uh, and they wouldn't they wouldn't supply him. So he sued them and he, he forced them to supply him. That's not something that you want to do. You don't want to be forcing your suppliers to supply you. That's not going to go well. And inevitably, the the whole Easy Cinema thing fell over. But it mainly was to do, I think, to uh, a misunderstanding of the market he was going into because he didn't realise how much of a closed shop it was. It's like mafia run the the cinema uh, industry. It's crazy. Um, there isn't any mafia involved, I don't think. Uh, <laughs> although, did you see that the other day about um, the mafia helping um, provide uh, PPE, um, personal protective equipment to people um, in Italy? Uh, <laughs> we'll see if we can find that in the news at the end, but I saw that was crazy. Um, next one's consumer wants and needs. Now, we talked about this, didn't we, a, a couple of seconds ago. Why is it so important? Well, is your product actually going to be wanted? Is it actually something that people want, something that people go uh, are going to need? Or is it something that you're interested in and that's about it? Now, with the birth of the internet and this crazy world that we live in now where we're all interconnected and we can, you know, sell overseas and things, the likelihood is you're probably going to be able to find some really weird Reddit post or some really weird forum somewhere where there's going to be people like yourself. Even if you're into the weirdest stuff imaginable, there's probably going to be a market for it somewhere. But then we've got to decide, one, is are these people going to pay? Two, um, where are they? You know, is it, is it geographically viable? Number three, um, is it a viable market? Like, is, the, is, it, is it worth it? Is there enough people going to be uh, in, sort of interested? Or is it so niche that um, a lot of people won't be interested in it? Or not enough to make it warrant um, spending the time and money on because remember you're probably gonna have to spend your money but you're also gonna have to spend the money of the um, of the investors or the bank and people like that as well we've also got product life cycle so we, we I know I keep talking about the product life cycle but where in the product life cycle is your product at the minute because when we're doing market research it doesn't mean that we have to do it right at the start it doesn't mean that we have to do it before launch it's sensible to do and I would be it'd be crazy to do it you know crazy to launch a product with no market research at all uh, but what about uh, products that you're looking for extension strategies? What if you're trying to relaunch a product? What if you're looking to a new market? What if you um, 
are looking for a small you know basically you're looking at the viability of keeping that product going that's a really strong one isn't it if you're going into a decline phase or if you're going into a sort of maturity phase and you you're starting to uh you know it's starting to go into that decline that dip um is it worth carrying on with this would be a really a good way of finding out wouldn't it because you you could do some market research and say well actually is there a, it, it, why is it that it's going down is it that it's competitors is it the price is it the is it fad is it trend what is it that's actually causing these uh, these changes to our um, our, our sales uh, effectiveness of promotion so objectives again is um the effectiveness uh, that our pro production, is, uh, sorry, promotion is doing. So, how well has the marketing gone? Have you um, been confident with it? Have you been happy with the marketing? So, you do a big marketing campaign, right? Th then you need to do some market research to find out one: do people know about it? So, if I was to say to you now, uh, a drumming ape, a drumming gorilla, uh, who would you think of? You'd probably think of Cadbury, wouldn't you? Why? Because it was such a strong image, such an amazingly powerful bit of advertising that. And it will be, always be seared into the minds of people who see it because it was so crazy. Um, and if you say to the, if you say drumming gorilla to a lot of people, or even if they hear the, I can feel it coming in the air tonight. As if they hear that, you automatically think of Cadbury. So it's an amazing bit of... Um, of marketing but also if we were to do the market research afterwards and say well um you know gorilla uh, what do you think of if i say gorilla if i said um drumming gorilla who do you think of and then we automatically say cadbury then that would be a fantastic bit of um promotion wouldn't it it would it would validate any money that we put into this completely because the market research shows that people immediately we say two words to them drumming gorilla and they say cadbury so it's <laughs> it definitely was a very very good marketing campaign for them. It's very easy to see. Um, consumer response to product. This is a good one as well, isn't it? Um, have you ever been asked to uh, fill in a, um, a questionnaire about how you feel about a product, how your experience has been with a product or a service, or th something like this? Uh, and um, that that is market research. That's market research in action. I'd be very surprised if you haven't. Um, I th you know I, I've done loads of them, um, and you get people ringing you up and stuff like that as well, don't you? But uh, to find out how you, you know whether you like it or not you know what was it what was your favorite bit was there anything that you need to change is there anything that you'd like us to see do differently um one of the big ones i always see with a lot of the time with video games or movies is sometimes they do these uh, focus groups they do some market research and they get the people together and then sometimes they leak the documents so it'll say something like um would you be interested in seeing more films in the Lord of the Rings franchise? And then people go, oh my God, they're thinking about doing more Lord of the Rings movies or whatever it is that they're talking about. <laughs> so it's difficult sometimes not to show your hand because um, when you're doing market research, there is, the, the, there is an element of the fact that uh, you might end up um, showing your competitors, showing the world, showing people that you don't want to. I mean, that could be a clever bit of marketing at the end of the day, couldn't it? Uh, oh no, we've leaked it. Uh, well, you can gauge the response. That's a bit of market research, isn't it? Leak some documents and then find out how people respond to them. That's what we're talking about, consumer uh, response, aren't we? I don't know. Maybe I'm just cynical and I think everybody's out to... Um, on me uh, then we've got finally uh, what is happening to demand a little bit like the product life cycle but what's happening to demand in the whole market how are our competitors doing is it is it that they're going to them rather than us is it is it that the the market in general is just declining now is it that the you know people are running out of things like like mp3 players ipods people don't buy them anymore um at the time um sort of the the, the sort of like 2000s um the early 2000s um sort of that that would have been they were amazing products weren't the ipod one of the most successful products ever made but um everybody wanted one it was the big thing like blackberry it was a massive thing people used to you know use it as the um as the uh, you know that's the main thing they want isn't it that's the uh that's the main product that they're after and um, so let's move on uh, it says the scope of market research and market research does not just focus on consumer wants and needs it aims to find out information about all sorts of aspects of the market that they're considering we've already talked about this and the intention is to gather evidence that can enable marketing and production decisions to be made in a more scientific way than would otherwise be possible now what do we mean by scientific well what we mean is uh, not going off your gut feeling essentially we mean that uh, if we can try and be um as you know based on fact based on uh data as we possibly can then 
hopefully it will give us a justification for making decisions and i think a lot of the time scientific decision making is also a, a really good way uh, in the real world this uh, it's probably not something that you would see in, in, a, in an exam question but it, in the real world of business it, ex, um, scientific decision making is a really good way of justifying your decisions to your boss so if you completely cock something up, if something goes wrong, if there's a, a product which you launch and then it completely fails, then your head's going to be on the line. They're going to come to you and say, what the hell are you thinking? What? Why have you spent all this money? It completely bombed. What happened? And then if you can say, well, look, we've got all this data. Look, this is what the market research we did. We got all these companies involved. We did the right things. And and yeah, I don't know. I think the, 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 the market's changed. It was something that we could have never have been aware of or, or something like that. Then that can, um, we can use it, can't we? The problem with that, the problem with um, scientific data like that and people using it to, to, to cover their own backs, which they do, and fair play to them, you know, I think I probably would do it myself. Um, the, the way they do it uh, sort of leads you to, to, to the conclusion that uh, it's going to slow down decision making. It's going gonna, it's gonna, to, if you have to, if you can't use your gut feeling sometimes, um, if it's not a mix of decision making like that, if it's not both, then uh, you're gonna you're gonna really suffer for it, aren't you? Eventually, because you might not take advantage of a really good situation. You might not get that first mover advantage. You might not be the first in the market, um, because you were going. Oh no, we're gonna do loads of market research first. Well, if you don't move now, then your competitors are gonna move, aren't they? So it, it's not easy. It's it's not always as simple as it sounds. Um. So first of all, let's have a look at um primary market research so primary market research primary research involves collecting primary data and this information which did not this is information that did not exist in any form before the research began now it's a really important one that is people get confused and i myself used to be confused about this i i i, I went into my exams completely not misunderstanding the the point of these so let me uh, let me clarify this primary data does not have to be collected by you Okay, I do not think that it has to be you. It can be anyone. It could be it can be someone working on your behalf. It doesn't matter like that. The main thing about primary research is it is brand new information. It did not exist before the research began. So we're not saying that uh, there was some data out there that we went and had a look at. We're not saying that we went on the internet and found some data that had been, you know, researched by someone else or something like that. This is data that's um, that's brand new to you. You've asked some questions. People give you their honest answers. That information didn't exist before because how could it? That's that's primary data. It's not. Or primary data is any stuff that's done by yourself. I think the reason why people get confused by that is because it is a it is a, a big part of it is the fact that you tend to do it yourself you tend to go out and, and get the information yourself or when we talk about business theory we tend to talk about the fact you do it yourself or employ a company on your behalf or something like that um, but it isn't that it's brand new information okay so a couple of different ones we've got questionnaires could be uh, email questionnaires they could be on your phone they could be um you know given to you in person we've got consumer panels consumer panels is where you get a couple of um thingies this bloody uh hair fever is affecting me my nose must see must get annoying on that on the stream constantly seeing my nose what, what, you know what I mean? i'm not trying to be rude it's just itchy um uh, consumer panels where you get um, a collection of um people very much like focus groups um, and ask them questions about the uh, the market, about how they feel about um, products. Y usually with the difference between consumer panels and focus groups. Focus groups, you tend to get um, a group of people from a certain subsection. You can use different sampling techniques with different ones, but a big one with consumer panels is it tends to be quite different parts of the market and stuff like that. We'll come back to it in a second. Th th there's very few differences between focus groups and, and consumer panels, though, in real terms um consumer panels you tend to use more than once rather than focus groups you might only use once but anyway we'll come back to it uh, test marketing is a good one test marketing they use a lot with apps where they'll release the app um in a certain market like usually geographic i have to say with this one or they might do it on you know ios rather than android the reason i mentioned that is because they do it uh they did it with pokemon go they released pokemon go 
um, in Australia first, and everyone was going mad and downloading the Australia APK so that they could they could uh, install it on their uh, on their phones before they released it here. And the idea was for a couple of reasons, but to see how people went with it, but also to stress test their system to make sure people could actually uh, use it because they didn't know what the they could never have known the kind of response they were going to get from Pokemon Go. Do you remember the kind of response that Pokemon Go went the summer of Pokemon Go? It was a bloody sight better than the, the summer of 2020, wasn't it? Um, I remember the good old days of Pokemon Go. It makes you want to play it again. Download Pokemon Go and uh, do it. <laughs> go, go and, uh, you know, when you're on your hour-long uh, mandatory uh, exercise, which I've definitely seen people uh, be out and not exercise it. Uh, sorry, out who have never exercised before. Massive fat people, that, uh, you know, wandering around, which is great because they're getting out. But at the same time, um, it's not the time for taking up new exercise now, is it? You know, come on, stay in. Anyway, um, focus groups. I'm not going to go with fat people. I know I'm overweight. I'm just saying. And um, uh, focus groups. And again, getting a group of people together, get them in a, get them in a room, um, ask them uh, questions about the, the thing, get, get usually focused on one specific thing that they're looking at at that moment in time. So let's have a look at these ones. So it says, advantages of using primary research. And these are the AO3 points that we need to do. So data can be collected that directly applies to the issue. This is a really good one, isn't it? We're not using data that's been collected for another reason. We're only using data that is specific to this situation that we're talking about now. And um, it's very, very customized to what we want to find out. So we're not spend we're not wasting money on it, not wasting time. Um, and it's hard, not that we can't misinterpret it, but it's harder to misinterpret, I think, the data if it's if it's something that you yourself have done. Um, because it's like um it's easy to you, you've seen it from from start to finish it's easier to keep track of uh, any bias um keep track of any issues with the data and things like that you can kind of control it a lot more um, which is better because you can be confident of the data rather than you know uh, going off off secondary data um the business which initially collects the data will be the only organization to access it so it can give you first mover advantage if it tells you something you might find out it might save you loads of money um if you find out that actually we need to get out of this market because this market's about to collapse have you seen that fads or ch you know what we found out was people are really not into this at the minute or it might um it might significantly it might tell you that you really need to change the way that you are with your products because people aren't interested in you you know i said i said um gorilla drumming and no one understood what i was talking about they said drumming gorilla what the hell's that well the marketing has been rubbish then hasn't it the marketing hasn't worked but if i was to say drumming uh, drumming gorilla and everyone went oh cadbury then again it's been successful hasn't it it's been that thing that we 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 know we we can tell ourselves we have access to that special data and other people in the market could do their own research but it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to have access to ours uh, it's up to date really up to date and we know all these external influences we know stakeholders affect it we know the world affects um economies and things like that um so having up-to-date data and not going off oh yeah well five years ago or 10 years ago or 15 years ago um you'll be telling me that blackberry next was is a is a well sought after product it, it isn't anymore is it but if you were to take you back to sort of the mid sort of the early 2000s uh, late 90s kind of time um or maybe sort of mid 2000s even uh, blackberry was still something that uh that was really really sought after and it was the be all and end all wasn't it uh, with a very very specific market which was uh, business people to begin with and then it went over to uh, to teenagers and things like that and finally it should be more reliable this is a big one you've got to remember that anybody who does some market research is essentially they have a hypothesis they're trying to prove a hypothesis and the hypothesis might be that um you know our our business is the most um positively seen in the market or um customers would positively uh, respond to a new product or whatever it is we, we go in with an idea that we're trying to prove that's the problem why are we doing it so if if you if you misunderstand that if you don't understand that um that you that that the person who is doing the data collection has a bias has a has a, um, an ulterior motive and I, I i don't mean an ulterior motive in a negative way but it, it could be negative to the overall um, thing so for example i'm doing some market research at the minute right i did some market research on um some like the 
like homeworks and things like that the importance the usefulness of homework right so um we've been doing some stuff with my class this year of, of doing we don't do homework we do a friday session instead um in the well, sort of last after class time um and then at the end of it i'll ask what people thought and whether they agreed or whether they thought that they'd actually benefited from it i think personally i've seen quite a big benefit from it i think uh you know not only in terms of workload stuff for me but also um my students seem happier with it but what i can do i can be confident of that because um I, I did it myself i can control that data i was there but if i was to say to you i really hate homework i really hate setting homework and then i do the market research that then proves that market that homework doesn't exist it doesn't doesn't benefit anyone do you not think that I've, i'm a bit biased do you not think that uh, i might just be making it say that i've actually got the data to back it up or am i making the data fit the situation so that's one thing that we've got to be aware of. Whilst it can be more reliable because um, we ourselves are doing it and we can be confident that we're taking the necessary steps to make sure it is you know, transparent, um, we need to make sure that we ourselves aren't instilling bias naturally um, because of the situation, because we're trying to impress our boss or because we're trying to get something changed or whatever it is. Something to be important. It's good AO3, AO4 that to understand that idea of the next level of thought really. And disadvantages of it can be expensive to collect. Why? Well, because it's um, time consuming. Uh, we have to get specialists to do it. There's all that that stuff about transparency and making sure it's it's um, it's you know collected well. Uh, it can take longer than secondary. Why can it take longer than secondary? Well, secondary you can just go on the internet and have a look. Secondary you can just go and um, go to a you know a company like Mintel or somewhere like that and ask for data on markets because there are market research companies that will go out there and just do market research basically on um, on industries and you can go to them and you can just buy the uh, buy the data. So it's not something that um, is is a massive issue, but it but it can take. Um, can take significantly longer um and, and by the time and unfortunately by the time that happens you might actually have missed the ball so it's, <laughs> you've got to know when to stop and um, the sample taken may not represent the views of all the pro um, population we're going to talk about that in a second of how you avoid that but um yeah if i was to ask my class if they liked um not doing homework and, and doing friday sessions instead then they might go oh yeah it's great because they've only ever known that um, or they might say, no, it's rubbish because the other teachers don't do it or whatever it is that they talk about. But just because what it works with one class doesn't mean it's representative of all homework, does it? I need to make sure that I, I continue to do um, data analysis to, to con continue to do my own market research to find out what the most effective way of doing it is um, what the most effective way of, of getting people's um, sort of the most out of them. Because that's ultimately what it is, isn't it? Um if the market research is, uh, method is flawed, the findings will be flawed. So if we, um, you know, badger people into saying the right thing in terms of, I say the right thing, the thing that we want to hear, then um, it's not going to be worthwhile market research, is it? We can be transparent about it, but uh, it won't necessarily be that useful to us because we can make market research say whatever we want sometimes we could put somebody in a situation i'm going to put one up if you can have a look at it um i wish i could show it you on stream but i i, I don't know um that this will show you um i don't think it'll show you uh, sound at the same time we'll have to test it i'll test it to see whether it did uh, it does and then I'll, I'll be ready for another one but I'll, I'll put it in the description there is a there is higgity pies i showed it to my class but if you've not seen it um there is an example um higgity pies the company uh, which is a small company but they do like um quite expensive pies that you can buy out of uh, tesco's and stuff like that uh, and they did a um, they did a, a video about uh, doing some market research and it is literally like i had said take all the component parts of the of of, of incorrect market research and and distill them into the perfectly wrong way of doing it and that would be what you'd see in that higgity pie <laughs> thing because it is terrible it's like the woman's um who does it uh, i think she might be the owner of the company but uh she's like she's invited the people in like um like they're already fans of it she's somehow got in contact with these people the the people who are on the on the board as well are weird like the one of them saying oh yeah well i've come back off holiday to get involved with this market research oh yeah that's going to be unbiased isn't it it's not like they've got a vested interest themselves is it uh, and then she's giving them gifts and stuff during it 
it's it's insane it's, it's literally the most ridiculous thing so I, I will link it in the description i'm sorry we can't watch it together because I, I absolutely love that uh, that bit of film because it is terrible uh, market research that um i need to get in touch with them really about that and just say what the hell are you doing and why are you putting it on display because it, it shows how <laughs> like crazy and they've got stuff like as well one more thing that they have on it is when they ask them to to judge the the stuff so they'll talk about price um and and they give them options like mm, yeah brilliant and stuff like that it's not like uh, it's <laughs> and they and they put the board out in front of everyone so you've got to walk in front of the rest of the room to put your answer on a board about pricing oh yeah that's that's convenient isn't it that's not going to make you feel awkward about it <laughs> it's just it's the most ridiculous thing um but I'll, I'll put it in higgity pies look to the description and i'll put it in at the end of the um at the end of the stream later on um so secondary what is secondary well secondary and um, it's also known as desk research why is it called desk research it's because it can be done from a desk and um, it involves the collection of secondary data and um, this is information which is already exists in some form it can be internal or external important that uh, internal to the business or external so what internal things can we use let's have a look so internal uh, secondary market research so uh, in your booklets if you've got the booklets you've got these uh, but if you haven't i've written them down for you it says existing market research reports so what about ones that we already have what about ones that we've done, um, sort of things like this, previous to this? Not something that's been done specifically for the inf this information, but what about? Oh well, we've got, we've done, we've done some market research on something similar to this. Oh well, can I have a look at that? Yeah, yeah, of course. There you go. Um, we've also got sales figures, so we can look at past sales figures. We can look at product life cycles. We can look at how products have done in the past. Um, reports from members of the sales force, so actually get people in, get people to have a conversation with you, get people to um, come and discuss, you know, things like that. That's still secondary, getting people's opinions on things um, in terms of past data and things like that. People who are um, more uh, experienced in that in that job than you are is brilliant secondary research. Yeah, that's fine. Um, and also um, company intranets. Uh, when we say intranets, that's usually like it's kind of like an internal internet, essentially, where we'll have documents and things like that. Um, some data, it's just sort of like them, them be able to securely uh, pass data around the company. Um, really good place to find out information about the company, how we're doing, things like that. Um, and brilliant way to find out old information if we need to. Now, so that's your secondary stuff. So internal secondary. What about external secondary then? What if we want to go outside the business? So it's not as easy as just, you know, asking someone or, you know, having a look at stuff that we've already got to do. But if we want to go external, then what about info from competitors? Let's have a look on the website. Let's have a look at their, their published accounts. If Remember, if they're a PLC, um, and to some extent, LTDs, uh, to some extent, there are, it depends on the situation. We're not going to go into this now, but uh, PLCs definitely have to publish their accounts. You can find out things and be, be wary of looking at them in, in too much detail because they can sometimes do what we call window dressing where they, they will make their accounts look better. It's not illegal, but it is it, you can move stuff around. You can move assets around into different areas of a balance sheet of, uh, of your accounts, various accounts in um, financial documents to make it look better or make it seem like something else is happening. Um we're not trying to defraud anyone. We're just trying to make it look the most positive we can. Um, so you've got to be careful with that because you've got to remember that, think about where, what that information is for. Are they lying? Not lying. Are they trying to positively mislead you? <laughs> um, sort of government in, uh, information. Government can give you information about businesses, about things like this. But again, um, uh, remember what that data is for um, and because you've got to keep in mind at all times um, is there any bias? Is there any way that this could be uh, wrong information? What? Why was this uh, this information collected in the first place? And would that impact the likelihood of us being successful? Um, we've also got uh, journals. Now, journals aren't something that you will probably look at yourself uh, yet. It, the usually journals are things that you use when you get to university. Uh, brilliant bits of kit. Um, they are... Um, Basically, uh, each each sort of industry of business uh, have journals, and they 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 peer reviewed, which means that uh, you have they like um, publications, they, they like magazines almost, but usually digital, um, but they are comprised of um, the the sort of. Uh, 
like market like like research topics and and papers that people have done on them and what they do when they call them peer assessed it's when other experts other people with phds other people with masters other people with degrees they go and have a look at them and they will say whether they think the market research is good enough so usually if you use journals it's usually had a lot of um expert opinion before um it gets to you so journals are a fantastic way of doing it and realistically when you get to university if you decide to go to university um they are one of the most useful sources of information because you don't really have to argue with them because you can say well look enough people have probably looked at this you know for it to be actually published in a journal it has to have some form of credibility it's not just going to randomly be you know launched into it um we also have Mintel. Now, Mintel is a, is a company, one of a couple of different companies uh, who do market research, one of the biggest ones, um, and they do do market research about different in industries. So they'll just do market research about the fast food industry, how's the, pe the you know what, how, how many pizzas are sold in the, in the world or whatever it is. They'll have a look at certain things. How, how's the clothing market doing? How's the uh, you know smartphone market doing? So you can buy market research, pre-made market research for you. Um, that they already do i'm not sure mintel will i don't know if you can can actually ask them to do primary research for you i don't know if you can with that i've never had to do it but i know that they're really good for secondary research and finally we've got the internet just be careful about where you get the, the information from the amount of times i see people quoting things like you know joe blogs at blog.com you know you think oh uh, i be, uh, oh well i got it off someone's powerpoint on the internet well think about it don't just put it in from anywhere it's important isn't it it's money at the end of the day this um, so, advantage or disadvantage? We'll just go really, really quick, okay? Uh, cheap. Advantage. Whoops. Uh, shows trends all the time. Advantage. Easy to collect. Advantage. There might be a bias, or it could be bias. It's, there probably is going to be bias. Disadvantage. Not reliable. Disadvantage. Quick. Advantage. May not be relevant. Um, disadvantage. And it could be out of date as well. Disadvantage. So, really, really easy, though. Let's, let's not spend any time on them. Now, we're nearly up to the end, ladies and gents. When we are getting there quickly. I just want to have a look at some application stuff. So, remember, when we talked about this, we talked about um, the importance of looking at situations, looking at the, um, the like, look, look, the, the, the importance of situations, but also the um, sort of putting it in context because market research is really really important but 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 the context of why you're doing the market research whether you're a small company a fledgling company a, a you know a well-established company and whether it's a brand new product whether it's a it's a variation on the theme whatever you're talking about it's really important that you put it into context for us so you need to be constantly saying well look from the different ma uh, methods identified justify the m most likely method to be used uh, for um, a small business local business so what do you think do you th if i was to say to you primary or secondary for a, a, a small local business you need to be thinking well access to finance access to ability to be able to fund this kind of stuff <clears throat> ability to time and things like that so aside from doing their own primary research in the sense of they might be able to ask people in the shop or whatever it is they probably are going to be relying on secondary research because they don't have the money or the time to be able to do it, do they? They don't have the um, sort of the finance, the resources available to them. Um, whereas a large multinational company can use both. They can do loads of primary research if they want. They can go to Mintel. They can do internet stuff. They don't have any any anything really stopping them from doing things. And then we've got a brand new product or service, which is more likely to do. Well, again, the, the next question I would ask you would be, well, is it a new company? Is it is it coming from a brand new company? Is it coming from a well-established company? Because I've Obviously, that will dictate their access to things and things like that. But um, with that one, I would be saying, well, hopefully they're doing a, a range of it. Hopefully they're doing some primary research because they've got to find out about it. But hopefully they've done lots of market research, which takes into account um, lots of secondary as well that says... Um, is do people want this product? Are people happy with this product? They've not just asked their mum and said, you know, oh, can you, uh, you know, is this a good idea? Because lots of people do that. Family and friends, no, yeah, okay, they're good. They're good to begin with, but they'll tell you anything you want. You want to hear? That's why people end up on bloody X Factor with no, you know, no talent. Um, why, why are you on this program? Because my mum told me I was a good singer. Well, you're not. All right, get off. Okay. Now, another thing we've got to, uh, got to mention before we finish, there's two, two more things I want to mention today is um, qualitative and quantitative, and I want to talk about sampling as well. Um, 
I'll just check. Uh, just give me one moment, actually. Um, I'm just going to check that it's not on here. Just one moment, please. Uh, click, 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 click. Because um, it might be. I don't. I just don't want to. I don't want to tread on my own toes here. If that makes sense. Like in when it comes down to it. Um, no, no, that's okay. Yeah, we'll talk about it in a second then. Okay, so qualitative versus quantitative anyway. So quantitative research aims to gather the information based on facts and can be figures. All right. Quantitative, quantity. It's to do with numbers a lot of the time, this one. Okay, so remember, if you're talking about um, qualitative research, then you've got to be talking about uh, sorry, quantitative research. It's important ones not to get them mixed up. Quantitative has the word quantity in, so it's going to be something that you can do based on um, things which can be figures, something that you can so Nine out of ten people say this or blah, blah, blah. You can't do that with qualitative because qualitative is opinion-based. So I can't say it's too it's too broad you can't you can't really put people into really easy to define things like that um so the next one um that we are we are going to talk about is uh, is is qualitative as well um it says it seeks to gather opinions and views for example what makes the shopping experience at tesco uh, different to that of aldi um you will have a various you will have different experiences won't you you will have different um um sort of opinions depending on your socioeconomic background um your different things you know your um your, your experience and things like that so your quality qualitative data can sometimes be more um useful for getting people's really true um sort of personal experience with it with a situation but is difficult to put into uh, I mean, because I disagree with you doesn't mean I'm correct. You know, it doesn't mean that you're correct. It might just be a difference of opinion. That's the issue, isn't it? Um, in, in this circumstance, if you're using too much qualitative data, how are we going to actually make any decisions on it? Because if you, you only ask, have, ask, have to ask people who's the best football team, and does it mean the person who has the most, uh, you know, the, the biggest uh, fan base, they're correct? I don't know. I suppose so. Is that the more the more people agreeing that it's correct means it's correct? I, I don't think it works like that, does it? Um, so anyway, it says... Um, let, let's just read through this really quickly. It says, so quantitative data aims to gather information based on facts and can be figures. So, for example, what is the average income for our customers? What is their weekly spending on food? Uh, quantitative research produces data that can be tested, i.e. statistically valid, therefore must be in a mathematical form, or it can be interpreted using graphs. So we've got that idea. We've got the 9 out of 10 people. We've got that we can make a graph out of something. We've got something like that. We've got the qualitative data, seeks to gather opinions and views, um, and it tries to discover attitudes and motivations for con uh, for consumers. So why are people going to it? Is it to do with the... Um, is it to do with the amount of time that we're spending on stuff? Is it to do with the amount of time that we're spending on creating products? What is it about our product that you like? Um, we might not be able to, you know, and we don't say out of these five options. We might just say, what do you like? You know, just tell us whatever you think. Um, okay, so that leads us to, uh, let me just put them on here. Um, sampling. Okay, so we've got our uh, we've got our primary and secondary we've got our um we've got our primary secondary we've got our qualitative and quantitative so we understand the difference don't we so primary is, is brand new information secondary is information that we didn't have access to before and that that we've got from a, a different source quantitative is stuff that we um that can be data essentially um and quant uh, qualitative is to do with uh, opinions and uh, feelings essentially okay Best way to think about it is like if you if you had a questionnaire if you had a quantitative one it would be on a scale of one to ten um say how good Mr Businessman's you know streams are that would be quantitative data if you wanted qualitative data um, qualitative data would be uh, what's your favourite thing about Mr Businessman there you go it wouldn't be a particularly good one because it it's a very biased uh, question that what is your favourite implying that you have a favourite um 
so the next question is and the final question for today really is is how do we make sure that we get the right people to answer our questions and how do we make sure that it's representative of everyone what do we do if you know if i was to ask someone about football i'm not into football i'm not into sports and stuff like that but if i was to ask someone who the best footballer is uh, and i went to ask someone who was into liverpool football club then they'd have i don't even have an opinion i don't even have an example for you because <laughs> i don't know enough about it but let's say they said some you know john smith who is a a footballer for liverpool football club and um, oh yeah he's the best footballer and then i was to ask someone else who, who liked manchester united and they said oh no it's martin smith you want uh, his brother but he but he's actually plays for us he's the best one that doesn't <laughs> that just because one of them says that doesn't mean that it's representative of everyone and if i had a room full of supporters of certain things they might all agree oh it's martin smith rather than john smith that's the best one doesn't mean they're correct I mean, I, I don't know how I would check that, but one of the things we can do to try and make ourselves more comfortable, the the, um, the sampling method a bit better, would be to have a look at this. So uh, you have got it in your booklet as well. There's lots and lots of information in there about it, but let's just have a look. It says, what is the key difference between random and quarter sampling? Let's just have a look at what it is. So random sampling. Well, random sampling is where you get a big chunk of people and what you do is you give them all a random number usually from a random number generator and you will um give them all an equal chance of being picked for a certain thing so hopefully the idea is to stop um stop bias so every member of the population should have an equal chance of being selected for the sample okay um and then hopefully it's like jury service they they do this with they don't usually um they, they do a difference of random and quarter with, with them as well the idea is that you're not supposed to be able to pick certain people in society who should be jurors yeah there are certain restrictions um and and they are with this as well if it's random sampling they won't just go into it if you're a you know a known criminal or if you are work for the competitor or something like that there are other things at play aren't there but um with the same thing in mind there are also uh, it's also important to, to if it's random to go yeah it is random and the, there can't be any bias from me because i didn't pick the people i just did a random ge number generator everybody had the same chance okay um so attempting to achieve randomness is the way um that we create expensive field work though because uh, it's um it's hard to do that completely random what get everyone in the country everyone in a potential market do we even have the data it's hard what we tend to opt for in the in the other one is the quarter sampling okay and now quarter sampling is how we refer to on this is the population is segmented into a number of groups which are specific characteristics so the population is divided into subgroups e.g um age sex um sexual orientation religion socioeconomic group geographic location whatever it is that we're talking about and then with each uh, subgroup a random sample is taken from them so the idea is that well what about if our market is made up of men and women what if we want uh, children and adults well how much children well let's say that the um i don't know let's say that, that we had uh 40 children well let's use 40 percent children then um in this one do you see what i mean so it, it makes it easier if we do the quarter um we might say um that we can how much how much of our market is made up of people well 60 percent is men 40 percent is women well let's get 40 percent um women and 60 percent men to come into the actually talk about the marketing that we're talking about then and and give us reliable data i hope that makes sense to you so that's quarter when we have a quarter of people that we have to actually fit in to uh, market research um what are the problems with sampling though um we do get biased responses um once we start getting people together obviously this will depend on you yourself and, and your questions and things like that um but it doesn't mean that we're we're going to be unbiased it doesn't mean that we have a um, you know a, an innate uh, an ability to to respond to bias and things like that um effectively we've also got poor or inaccurate techniques so what about if we go into it wrong what if we um you know what if we have a vested interest what if we um spend too much time on it or not enough time on it or we we mess around too much with the data or things like that and every sample by its nature cannot be totally reliable you didn't ask everyone so you might just get you might just happen randomly to get a room full of people who all agree with each other what are the chances of that but you might do <laughs> you know um or you might get you might get uh, ones that give uh, you might happen to get um loads of people who di completely disagree with the average person well we're looking for the average consumer we're not really bothered about the you know the outlying people it's like 
what's the, we don't know sometimes we still get we, it can happen so he says the reliability of the results improves as the sample size grows the bigger the sample size the more the more research that we do the better and the more uh, likely that we are to be successful the more likely it is to be um you know uh, trustworthy data but it doesn't mean it's perfect and it doesn't mean that it can't be wrong so just keep that in mind all right final thing i want to mention today is this one so uh, evaluate the usefulness of market research to stakeholders i always mention stakeholders competitors customers employees shareholders i want you to spend some time now going through these um and maybe write a little paragraph for each one um just just to see if you can do it I'll, I'll just run through what the main points for them but i'd love you to have a go as it's really really useful brilliant uh, exam prep for you so competitors why is uh, market research good for um well good or bad for them evaluate the usefulness for your competitors it's good that you're doing market research because potentially they might be able to have access to it hopefully you'll keep it to yourself but you never know if you're silly you might give them give them the data and um, so it can be quite useful to see what you're doing if they clock what you're doing it can be very useful because you can do it with your competitors as well what are they actually doing market research on the minute or they're doing market research on energy drinks all right so they're thinking about doing some energy drinks are they do you see what i mean so it's it's pretty useful for them because they can keep an eye on what you're doing and they can they themselves can do the market research as well sort of use it against each other for customers um it's very useful because it gives them uh, the opportunity to get involved with the company it gives them opportunity to, to use um use their their sort of abilities to um sort of like uh, give you their opinion be more involved that kind of stuff and and we like that that you know we like to be connected to these companies we like to uh you know spend a little bit of time with them and and you know feel feel that connection it's all about that relationship marketing isn't it making sure people want to come back employees why is it useful for them well it's useful for them in the sense that they um they they are going to be able to um confidently make decisions that's going to be backed up with both primary and secondary data and hopefully we'll protect their jobs we'll protect their um you know what do we say that, that employees want employees want uh, job security which it's going to help with because hopefully if they completely cock something up then it's not going to be help them held responsible completely because they've got the data um and it's going to help the business to continue remember we always want to talk about what the stakeholders main wants are and employees want good wages as well so is it going to help the company continue operating as they want yeah it is uh, and shareholders it's brilliant for them because it, it allows the company it allows them to see the company being uh, proactive and trying to come up with new products inevitably hopefully leading to increasing revenue and profit and them getting um you know getting more uh, dividends and things like that now i know it's been a little bit rambly today um you know in terms of stuff but uh, that's the way the cookie crumbles sometimes you know i've got to i've got to get back into it after my uh, my day off that i had um but we're gonna have a little look at news um a lot has changed in the last couple of days so let's have a little look now um oh what what this uh, i'm not oh no let's have a look at this so this has just been announced I, I heard this the other day but i didn't think he was actually going to go through with it he says here president trump says the u.s will stop funding the world health organization accusing it of mismanagement his announcement is widely condemned with bill gates calling it as dangerous as it sounds the UK government promises that all care home residents and staff with COVID-19 symptoms will be tested. Charities say the virus is running wild amid outbreaks of more than 2,000 care homes. India has extended its nationwide lockdowns until the 3rd of May. Singapore has made it mandatory to wear a face mask as soon as you leave your house. Interesting. This one about Trump. Goodness me. This is crazy. As a part of the US administration's economic response to the coronavirus outbreak, tens of millions of Americans are set to receive checks worth $1,200. According to the US media, President Donald Trump's name will be printed on every single one. The Washington Post will then reported the news on Tuesday, saying it's, it was the first time a US president's name has uh, appeared on a check sent out by the Internal Revenue Service. Why? Because he wants you to think it was him personally that did it. Goodness me, this, it's crazy. We're living in these times and there's still people who are trying to you know, make a name for themselves. Goodness me, it's not the time, is it? Um, goodness, yeah. <laughs> He's... A, he, he's i don't get the guy he, he he doesn't seem like right does he he doesn't seem stable he seems to be just making stuff up as he goes along 
I think this is one of the things that over the last couple of years, though, we've been trying to make it so that people don't trust experts, aren't they? So do you remember the whole thing about um, Michael Gove saying we're fed up with experts? That that summed up people. Oh, well, what do experts know? Oh, well, people are wrong all the time. Doesn't matter if you've got a doctorate. It doesn't matter if you're a thingy. And and now we're <laughs> now that they've absolutely trashed the reputation of uh, of listening to experts, we've got. Um, We've got idiots going on TV who are claiming to be experts in stuff. Did you see the thing about Donald Trump about saying uh, where he keeps saying he's not a doctor, but he's got common sense? Well, I don't want someone with common sense to be doing my operations, thank you. I'd like a doctor to do it. I don't want someone with common sense to be, um, you know, sorting out my car. I'd like a trained mechanic to do it, please. That's the point. I mean, you'd think I don't want, uh, you know, uh, someone with no skills at all to be managing the country, but they'd just let anyone do it, haven't they? He doesn't know what the hell he's doing. He's making it up as he goes along. He thinks it's all about marketing. I don't know. Maybe he's not. As I said, I can't talk about the, the, the personality of the guy, <laughs> but I don't know. He seems to be completely going about it the wrong way, doesn't he? Uh, let's have a look at this one. It says, uh, my firm is viable, but I can't get a loan. So another little bit of external influence here. It says Gary Cosby. Uh, Crosby wants to keep his staff on, but like all the small firms, his profitable business now faces running out of cash uh, owing the coronavirus uh, shutdown. Uh, he runs into refurb, which refurbishes pubs, hotels and restaurants. He says that he can demonstrate three years worth of profits with 50,000 cash in the bank. Yet because his bank decided he didn't wish to support the construction industry, he failed the test uh, required banks only to lend according to their pre shutdown criteria. He was rejected for a government back loan last week. My accountant said, you can put it off... You can put off paying your VAT, but that's up to date. They said, well, you can put off paying your national insurance, but that's kept up to date too. So for doing the right thing, I can't get help. This is an interesting one, actually. I've talked to a couple of different people who feel like they're being punished for doing the right thing. And, uh, you know, I've talked to a couple of small business owners who said, I do keep my tax up to date. I'd have been better not doing. It's like they're trying to encourage you people to, to do the wrong thing. And this is the reality of the situation, isn't it? People like Gary Crosby, people who are doing it, £50,000 cash in the bank sounds like a lot, but it won't keep that business running for very long. And and businesses are trying to um, get get that loan. But if business, if the government say that they can have access to them and then won't, it won't make it available to them, then the companies will fail. That's just a, a, a thing, isn't it? It's just a um, thing. This is an interesting one. Let's have a look at this. It says... Yeah, you see, I, I clocked this. I clocked this as soon as they said that they, they brought it out, right? Burger King plant-based Whopper ads banned. It says, Burger King has been banned from showing adverts suggesting its Rebel Whopper, which is cooked alongside meat and contains egg, is vegan-friendly. The Advertising Standards Authority said that the, claim, the chain's claim the burger is 100% Whopper, no beef, could be understood to mean it did not contain animal products. Burger King said it had been clear and transparent in its marketing. The Vegan Society said it was a missed opportunity. I totally agree. It's crazy. I don't think they can even say that it's vegetarian. Because what they're doing is, they're, 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 the way I understand it anyway, that they're, they're, um, they're cooking the patty, the vegetarian patty, um, they're cooking that in the juices of the, the 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 meat burgers. That's why it tastes like a burger. Like that's not vegetarian. That's not vegan. That's crazy. It doesn't seem to. It says, yeah, our first plant based burger. It is. That's cheeky because remember, it, that that does imply that it's vegan. They're right there. Um. The green colour palette and the timing of the ads, the product was releasing coincide with, ve uh, yeah, this vegan annuary, um, veganuary, uh, it contributed further to the impression that the product was suitable for vegans and vegetarians. I thought it was. I thought it was, definitely. But the ASA said we considered that it was not sufficiently prominent to override the overall impression that the burger was suitable for vegetarians and vegans. When the burger was launched, the fast food chain said it was aimed at those who want to reduce their meat consumption. Um yeah, I think it's an interesting one. But we talked about the ASA um, and their actual things. They, they've, they've banned them, so they've stopped them doing them. Interesting one. And if you if anybody's tried one of these vegan burgers, will you tell me what it's like? Because obviously we can't now, but, um, you know, uh, it's it's <laughs> we can't try them now. KFC was doing something similar. Um, oh, nice. And let, let's, uh, let, let's finish off with this. Let's finish off with this chap. Um, 
Jeff Bezos um, adds $24 billion to his fortune. The founder of the boss of Amazon has been seeing his wealth swell by $24 billion after soaring demand for online shopping sent the firm's share price to a new high. Jeff Bezos has a fortune of $138 billion, according to the Bloomberg Billionaires Index, cementing his position as the world's richest man. Amazon has benefited from the surge in internet shopping by people forced to stay at home during the COVID-19 outbreak. The firm has been recruiting thousands of workers to help cope with demand. However, Amazon has also been criticised by employees in the US over workforce protection against the coronavirus. If you look back on a previous thing I put in the description about um, Amazon, uh, the, um, what's it called, uh, Panorama in, um, thing that, that they did on, on, on Amazon. This guy, you don't need £138 billion, dear. Goodness me. I mean, fair play. Um... Fair play to the guy. Like he, 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 he did. He wasn't just anybody. This guy, though, he's a genius, and he was from, uh, you know, he, he was from a financial background. He was very successful independently and things like that. But it's crazy. You do not need that kind of money. I think that, come on, you know, like give some away. Like you know, especially in this day and age, you know, you think like any money that you've made on this company, he doesn't need that kind of, of craziness wealth yeah you know it's probably could you even spend 138 billion if you tried you know like I, I don't think i think i could buy everything i could ever dream of and never spend that kind of money anyway thank you very much for having me thank you very much for coming i hope it has been useful for you i will see you at 10 o'clock tomorrow we'll be going through another topic um i will um yeah so if you need me you know where i am uh hit that like hit that subscribe and i will see you tomorrow